from last lecture, the lecture on this Tuesday, uh, we started looking into magnetostatics in free space. And first thing is about uh, obtaining a magnetic field from a given current distribution. And we learned about two methods. The first one is Biot-Savart law. It's just an, basically an integral form uh, uh, of obtaining B field from a given current distribution. And the line current, surface current, and volume current, uh, the basic mathematical form are exactly the same, but just line integral changes to surface integral and volume integral, right? And um, as I emphasized uh, last lecture, we practiced how to translate this DL and AR and R as a function of given coordinate variables, right? And then uh, the thing that you need to keep in mind is that you must uh, differentiate the coordinates like a source position and the position of interest. And the way I do it, this is just my convention, is putting prime uh, for a source position and uh, doing unprime for uh, the, the, the position of interest. Okay. And once you are successfully doing this, like the, translating DL, R, and AR as a function of coordinate variables, the, uh, everything left is just a simple uh, integration, right? So uh, we practiced this many times in last lecture. So I don't think I need to uh, repeat this, but let me know uh, if you have any, any question here, any, anything unclear about applying uh, B.O. Sabat law. Okay, so I, I imagine there's no problem doing this because it's just, uh, well, of course there can be some, in, some uh, complicated situations that you uh, find the difficulty uh, setting the coordinate systems, but uh, I would say that it's just a technical complication, not about the, uh, if you, as long as you understand the fundamentals uh, here, I think it's fine. Okay, then uh, we try to repeat the same problem using Ampere's law. And then Ampere's law uh, corresponds to the Gauss law in electrostatics. So what it tells is that if you take a line integral of a closed loop of a B field, then this is equal to the enclosed current amount by this uh, uh, by the surface defined by this closed loop. Okay, so this is the integral form of uh, Ampere's law, and here this is a, a differential form of Ampere's law. So uh, again, the most important thing. Uh, in applying Ampere's law is ruling out the possibilities, right? So B, again, can be, depends on uh, three coordinates. I'm sorry, uh, direction of B uh, can be along three uh, directions, X, Y, Z, R theta phi or rho phi Z. And then uh, each of this component can be dependent on coordinate variables. So in terms of dependency, I, I would say there are nine possibilities, right? And then what you need to do is you need to do uh, a smart um, symmetry argument to ruling out these possibilities. Let's say due to this, it has to go to zero. And then due to this symmetry, uh, this one also need to go to zero. 
then we already erased six possibilities and we are left with three possibilities. And then we, we, we further apply uh, the, the symmetry to ruling out the dependence, like coordinate variable dependence, right? And then we ended up having like something like by only depends on x, right? And then, then the, the problem becomes extremely simple, right? It's just uh, finding a function of a single variable and that's it, right? So, so I would say um, for most of you, uh, what you've concentrated before was probably uh, applying, uh, like taking the Ampere's loop and then finding this function, what's this function? But what's more important is this part, the upper part. Okay. So that's that. So for, for this case, in infinite line, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the infinite line, uh, we ruling out uh, BZ and B rho, and B can only along phi direction, and then B phi can only depend on rho. So the only possibility here uh, is B phi as a function of rho, okay? And then by setting the ampere, Ampere's loop uh, as a circle, then uh, we can determine actually P phi was mu zero i to pi rho, okay? And that's it. So um, on like uh, on, uh, an extension of this problem is given here. Like this is kind of famous extension of this problem. So instead of having a line current, we have now a volume current. So what you are looking at here is a cross section, like cut, uh, cross cut of a coaxial cable. So coaxial cable is composed of inner cable, right? Inner conductor and the outer conductor. And the in, inner conductor, the current is flowing uh, towards you like here. And then outer conductor, the current is flowing towards screen, okay? Like, uh, which is written like this. And then uh, the question is, and then, and then each coordinate, uh, the radius of each point is given like A, B, and T. T is the thickness of the second conductor. So uh, what you need to figure out is the B field, okay? But basically, uh, so what you solved previously was the infinite line current with I. And then what you're solving now uh, is, is this, right? So the inner, inner conductor carrying current I along this direction, outer conductor carrying current I along that direction. And then we assume that current is distributed uniformly throughout the conductor. Right, and because the symmetry is basically the same for these two problem, we don't need to repeat the symmetry argument, right? So we know that B should be along phi direction and it can only depends on rho. We don't need to do this again, right? Because the symmetry is basically the same. What we need to do is just determine this, okay? And, and, and doing this is easy. You can just uh, setting a Ampere's loop, a Ampere's loop with radius rho, okay? Then uh, B dot DL, which is mu zero I enclosed current. And, and then this term becomes uh, B phi. And then DL of course, in this case is as a circumference of the circle, which is two pi rho, right? So this part is fixed. No matter uh, like what, what value uh, rho is, it doesn't matter because we have like a variable rho here. And then what actually changes is this one, mu zero I enclosed, enclosed by the current. So I enclosed changes uh, as rho changes, right? So when rho is smaller than A, then I enclosed must be what? I zero, a squared rho squared 
Do we need any explanation for this? So the reason why a squared rho squared uh, comes in is because the, the entire area, cross-sectional area is pi a squared. And then area enclosed by the Amperian loop is pi rho squared. So, and then we know that uh, current is uniformly distributed. So the ratio, ratio of the area becomes the ratio of current. So I, I naught is the uh, total current. So total current and then ratio of the uh, area. So that's that, right? And then once rho becomes equal to or larger than A and then smaller than B, so when the current is in this region, then uh, enclosed current is fixed to I zero, right? Because no, no current change occurs. And then finally, uh, not finally, but like if, you, if B becomes equal to and larger than B, uh, rho is equal to and larger than B, but smaller than B plus T, then now we have current flowing in opposite direction, right? So uh, enclosed current must be I naught, which is the current of this one, minus uh, the current uh, flowing in, in, in this part. You can, you can take the uh, current ratio, I'm sorry, uh, area ratio. So the area ratio is I naught, uh, what's the area? Uh, B plus T squared minus B squared, and then uh, rho squared minus B squared, right? That's the area ratio. And finally, uh, when rho becomes equal to or larger than B plus T, then the current flow in the inner conductor and outer conductor cancels each other out, right? Same amount. So becomes zero, I zero becomes zero. I'm sorry, I becomes zero. So in this case, um, again, the symmetry thing, the direction of the B field, the dependence of a B field is are just the uh, same as the previous problem. What you need to determine is the amount of enclosed current uh, by a Amperian surface. Right? And then the enclosed current uh, form is given here. And then you apply this, then you get uh, B phi, and that's it. That's the end of the problem. So if you do that, you get this relation. And then this is kind of makes sense because, uh, let me explain this. Like, so uh, because we know that B phi two pi rho, is equal to I enclosed, right? And then, so B phi is basically proportional to one over rho from here, and then I enclosed. I enclosed is also dependent on, on rho. So, uh, like, like in this regime, when I enclosed is a constant number, I zero, then H, I'm sorry, B is dependent on one over rho dependence, right? Whereas in this region, uh, I enclosed is actually proportional to A squared rho squared. So it's dependent on rho squared. And then we have another dependence of uh, one over rho. So multiplying this, you get simple uh, linear dependence on rho, right? And, and similar thing uh, happens again here. Uh, what's happening is that uh, on top of this one over rho dependence, as we uh, as the Amperian loop uh, is going into the second uh, cylindrical shell, the current amount rapidly decreases. Right, the current amount is not like constant, but it rapidly decreases as uh, uh, rho increases. So on top of one over rho, it, uh, there's a, another decrease. So it, it more rapidly drops down to zero. And then after then it becomes zero, right? So, uh, so let me know if you uh, have anything, anything unclear about 
this problem. Yeah, I guess so. Um, uh, Kim Jumo asks, is B field always continuous? Uh, that's not the case. Uh, if we have a uh, current sheet, uh, B field can be discontinuous. Like for instance, we, we, can, we can think about uh, a, a good example here. So assuming that uh, we have our inner conductor have radius A, whereas our outer conductor have radius B with zero thickness. Okay, infinitesimally uh, thin thickness. Then what happens is that we make this region into infinitesimally short, so that end up become a uh, B field end up become discontinuous like this, and then this suddenly, right? So if you have a sheet current, uh, uh, B field can be discontinuous. Okay, that was a nice question. Right, so let's move on to, uh, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna go through a few more questions, a few more examples about uh, Ampere's loop, uh, Ampere's law, and then uh, start to talk about, um, you know, magnetic vector potential and, uh, and more advanced topics. So we have solenoid here. So let's do uh, the symmetry argument first. So I guess no one would question that we need to take um, cylindrical coordinate here, right? That's just for sure. No one would want to choose X, Y, Z or R theta phi. We, we need to choose a cylindrical coordinate here. So then possibilities are this, like B rho, B phi, B z, and each of this can be dependent on rho phi z. So these are all possible cases. And then first thing we can remove is because the current is along phi direction, and then B field must be perpendicular to current, this goes away, right? This is easy thing. And then, and then this and that, B rho and B z. So, uh, and then uh, as we did earlier, uh, in this case, B rho is impossible. Why? Uh, like same, like uh, if we have a B rho component, then if we flip it, current direction flips, but like uh, B field direction doesn't flip. Like if we flip it like on like uh, upside down, right? So that there's a problem. So B rho cannot be possible. And BZ for instance, if like BZ was this direction, then if we flip it, then B field is also flipped uh, along with the, the current direction. So there's no problem. So BZ is possible, right? The reason I'm going this a little fast is because we, we talked about this uh, where, when we did, when we did um, the B field of an infinite line current. And then, and then let's talk about the dependence. Now this system also has azimuthal symmetry, right? Like rotating symmetry. So it, it cannot depend on this. And then uh, what about this? Z. Z also like uh, the system has a translation or symmetry along Z, Z direction. So it cannot depend on Z. So the only possibility is BZ as a function of rho, right? So this is just one possibility then we can, we can have. But this is not the end of the story. So now uh, we choose this loop first. Okay, 
we take Amperian loop uh, like here outside the solenoid. Then what, what's happening is that uh, because B, B only has G component, only this part and, and that part can contribute to the integration. Like if we take B dot DL, right? So uh, I think it's better to just uh, show you here. So, so we are talking about here, like for the uh, loop one, uh, only these two sides contribute, which is BZ row one minus BZ row two. So this is row one, row two, for instance, okay? And then from this, and then there's no current enclosed. So we know that BZ at row one and BZ at row two must be same regardless of row, right? It, this, this argument uh, applies as long as we are outside the solenoid, right? So BZ of row outside the solenoid is just constant, right? Then what's that constant? That constant must be zero. Why? Because uh, when rho goes to infinity, bz anyway becomes zero. And then we know that this bz is constant. So then it must be zero, right? To satisfy uh, this condition. So outside b is zero. Now we take second loop like this. And then we know that outside is zero. Then the only thing that contribute is the inside, right? So that inside BZ L is equal to the enclosed current amount. So enclosed current amount is determined by this. So how many turns? So each of these carrying current I, and then we multiply how many turns are in, uh, enclosed in, in this length, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mu zero n l i, right? And then here we have another l, so l and l cancels each other out. So b is mu zero n i along z direction. And then and then when it's outside, it's zero. And from this, uh, from this we know that b of z direction g component actually even not depends on rho, right? Just doing, by doing the final calculation. But this possibility again, cannot be ruled out by symmetry argument. The final possibility like B, Z of rho was, uh, and then this rho dependence removed when we actually applied uh, Ampere's law, right? So any question here, any, anything uh, unclear? So if you have a solenoid, a B field is mu zero I uh, along Z direction. And then uh, within the solenoid, uh, B field is actually the same. Uh, it does not depend on the position. Any, any question? You can just leave question, uh, even though I'm just talking about something else. Okay, just keep typing. If you're uh, typing, if you've, been, you've been typing something. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, we can talk about a solenoid. I'm sorry, toroid. Toroid is nothing but, uh, uh, so you have a solenoid and solenoid is linear thing. And then you're just making this solenoid into a, another donut, which is a toroid. Okay, so this is toroid. And then uh, in this case, because we know that solenoid uh, B field is along Z direction, for toroid, we know that B field should be along B phi direction, 
right? Like along, along this direction. And, and then uh, depending on rho, we can calculate uh, how much of current we are dealing with. And then you can see uh, the, you know, when rho is smaller than rho zero, right? When rho is smaller than rho zero, there's no current enclosed. But once rho becomes larger than rho zero, all the currents enclosed. And this old current is nothing but n i, right? N is the number of turns, like total number of turns. So n i is the total current. And then uh, Ampere's loop is two pi rho, and then direction is B phi. So B phi is mu zero n i divided by two pi rho, okay? So in this case, unlike the case of solenoid, B field amount, depends on the position, right? Of the solen, uh, of the toroid. So it depends on rho, okay? And assuming that uh, this toroid looks like rho zero is much, much larger than A, like uh, A is the kind of the, uh, you know, 2A. 2A is the uh, size of a solenoid, then, we can just assume, we can approximate that B is virtually constant. But otherwise, uh, B field uh, is inversely proportional to rho, okay? So it depends on position. Just let me know uh, if you have any question about uh, all this derivation. I guess uh, you are very familiar with this, this contents, right? You've uh, in uh, elementary physics, like a, a freshman physics class, you probably uh, solved the solenoid, toroid, and all this case and applying the Ampere's law many times. So uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of sure that you are familiar with these concepts, but uh, if you're not, don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay. And uh, as a final example of Ampere's law, we can also uh, do a infinite sheet of current. And in this case, uh, let's, also, again, do some, some symmetry argument. So in this case, because uh, uh, the current has direction uh, along a y direction, so we cannot take um, uh, cylindrical coordinate. So it's better to take x, y, z. And then each of these can depend on x, y, z. So how to rule this out? Uh, because current is y direction, so no by, right? That, this is the obvious thing. The question is bx and bz. And then we can apply the same argument. Let's say we have bz. And then if we flip the, the problem, like upside down, then the current flow Direction of the current flow changes. If you, if you rotate the system like this, 180 degrees, then current flow becomes uh, an opposite direction. Whereas the B field direction stays the same, which is a problem, right? So BZ is impossible. BX is possible because BX direction changes too. Okay, so then uh, uh, what can we do? So we know that uh, Bx, uh, B, uh, that the direction of the B field must be along X direction. And then the dependence, we need to check the dependence again. And then uh, because the, uh, the system has translation and symmetry along X, Y direction, right? So if we change the system X direction, Y direction, uh, the source, uh, the, the problem is basically the same. So there's no XY dependence. So BX as a function of Z. 
That's the only possibility in this problem. By the way, uh, you, you should not assume that all problem you can do uh, this, right? The, the reason uh, why you can do this uh, easily and ruling out all these possibilities is because we are dealing with a problems with re high symmetry, right? So we can uh, rule out many possibilities without uh, thinking too much. But in reality, the system uh, doesn't have this good symmetry. So uh, like in research, if you go research, there's no, you know, almost no possibility you can rule out. It, so in, you need to keep like all nine possibilities and you need to solve it like numerically rather than analytically. Okay, so Bx as a function of Z, and then we take Ampere's loop like this, like in this problem. And then because we know that B has only X component, uh, this line and that line is irrelevant. And only these two contribute to the uh, calculation. So if you uh, uh, do this, the amount of uh, uh, sources, if you do this one, two, three, four, then B dot DL becomes two BX, two BX multiplied by B. So two BX. And, and then we assume that BX is along positive direction here and negative direction there, okay? So two BX uh, multiplied by B. And then amount of enclosed current is KY B. So KY is the, uh, so K is the current density, right? And then if you multiply uh, the length, you get the current. So if you, uh, if you add length here, length is the uh, B again. So you, you have current and B and B cancels each other uh, out. And you ended up having B field is mu zero KY divided by two or minus mu zero KY divided by two, depending on which side uh, you are at. And then again, if I address uh, Kim Junmo's question, uh, in this case also, uh, we have like a sheet current. And then if you look at the B field, if you draw it as a function of Z, it's just a constant like this. When, when Z is negative, it's like this. When Z is positive, it's like this. So there is a jump. Right, so there's a discontinuity when you have a sheet current, and of course, if a, this was not a sheet current, but you have a finite thickness, then you may see I don't know something some something like this, right? If, if there was a finite thickness, then uh, your B field wouldn't be uh, discontinuous, but it becomes continuous with a, a linear. I'm not sure whether it's a linear or not, but anyway, uh, it's going to be continuous. Okay, so this is it for the Ampere's law. Um, if you have any question, uh, this is a good time to ask. Okay. Okay. By the way, uh, some students actually ask me uh, not not in this lecture, but like in in other lectures, ask me about uh, what is the good way to uh, kind of get a high score in the exams, like a uh, midterm exam, final exam, and like in general, like in major courses. Um, in my experience, uh, uh, to me, the best way was actually uh, solving exercise problems. So, you know, some people prefer to read textbook again and again, like until they feel that they understand the contents. But to me, that wasn't uh, uh, 
you know, the proper way. I mean, even though I feel that I understand, it was not actually. I, when I tried to solve problem, you know, it was kind of, I, I didn't know like uh, or how to start solving the problem. So to me, the best way is just a flipped manner, like directly jump on to a uh, exercise problems at the end of the book chapters or like uh, uh, exercises out there in the Google and then try to solve it. And then you probably, uh, uh, some of the easy problems you can solve it, but most of them you cannot. And then you go back to your textbook and then read that part, figure out what's going on, solve that part, and then uh, go exercise again. As once it's solved, just go back to exercise again. And then, and then I think that type of an iteration is much more efficient in terms of learning uh, then just uh, try to understand things first and then jump into uh, exercise questions. This, this is probably about just the preference, but to me, uh, that was uh, way more efficient than, uh, than this way, because that gives me a sort of a motivation, like what to focus on in the textbook. And especially because uh, when I was undergrad, my English was really poor. So to me, it was really difficult to read every text in the textbook, right? It's kind of too long. And, and um, so uh, to me, the, the best way was just try to solve the exercise right away. When I have problem, uh, go back to the textbook, try to find a similar equation, and then just look, uh, read, try to read like some of the text above and below like uh, just a few texts and then try to figure things out and then go back to exercise. Like that was uh, to me the, you know, worked pretty well. So if I recall my previous, like my, my undergraduate uh, age, uh, before I take exams, uh, I think I, I try to solve all the exercise problems in the textbook, like not like a handwriting, but like, a, a, you know, uh, when you solve problems a little uh, for, a, for a fair amount of time, then you know that some problems you can solve without actually uh, solving it, right? You know that you can solve those problems you can skip and then just focus on uh, difficult problems. And that worked pretty well to me. Okay, so uh, there's another question. There's a few questions from uh, Fakri. Can we not use symmetry argument? Like, can we write integration and the components would disappear automatically? Okay, this is a nice question. Uh, so what he asks, like, uh, I think it's better to go to simple case to explain better. Like in this case, so what he asks, uh, if I understand correct correctly, uh, let's say so if we take an Amperian loop like a circle, then automatically b dot dl becomes because this is uh, dl is already uh, a phi uh, rho d phi, so this becomes B phi, a uh, B phi rho D phi, right? So then uh, by taking the Amperian path, by choosing the Amperian path, we are basically choosing uh, the B field information that we want to know. That is true, right? That is, that is true. So that from, by doing this, we know B, uh, the information of B phi. Right, but the problem is, uh, this process doesn't give any information about B rho or B z. Right, so we don't know anything about B rho and B z by just doing this. Like assuming that B rho was non-zero, B z was also non-zero. Okay, even in this case. If we perform this integration, we only have V phi component due to the choice of our Amperian pass, right? So that uh, I would say uh, uh, 
without a symmetry argument, uh, it is difficult to determine like, um, you know, B rho and BG. And then what we want to know is the, uh, the full B form, like what's the direction of B. And then we need to know uh, the fact that B rho and BG is actually zero. And to know that symmetry argument is required. And Park Chejin asked, does the current density in this problem means charge per area? Uh, no. Uh, so here, here the current density is uh, like a current per length. So sheet current is like, if you multiply length to the current, uh, length to the density, you get the current, right? So it's it's not about charge, it's about the current. Not sure whether that um, answers the question. But anyway, uh, here the sheet current density is, um, is defined like this. If you multiply the cross-sectional length, then you get the current. Yeah, and similarly, if you have a, a volume current, then if you multiply the area, you get current. I'm sorry, I have the volume, volume current density, then if you multiply area, then you get uh, current. Hope that answers the question. Is there any other question? Okay, if not, uh, let's keep going. So, uh, so like, um, let's compare the electrostatics and magnetostatics, okay? So electrostatics, we learned about Gauss law, right? This Gauss law. Gauss law. And then we also know that in electrostatics, curl of E is zero, right? So uh, what, does, what that means is that um, electric, uh, in, in electrostatics, what's creating electric field is charge and then electric field is created in a diverging manner right because you have divergence here that's how electrostatics work and then uh, if you look at the magnetostatics uh, we need to know that first there's no point source there's no uh, magnetic monopole so di uh, divergence of b is zero which means uh, magnetic field never uh, been created in a diverging manner. There's nothing like a magnetic charge, okay? But magnetic field is created by current. This is the Ampere's law. And then uh, in, a, in, a, in a rotating manner. So, these are the big difference between electrostatics and magnetostatics. Electrostatics, we are talking about charges creating electric field in a diverging manner. And then magnetostatics, we are talking about currents creating B field in a rotating manner. And then the other possibilities, like uh, here, like a uh, uh, curl of E, and here divergence of B is zero. So it, the other possibility is not allowed in electrostatics and magnetostatics. So that's the big difference between these two in terms of mathematics. Okay, then how, uh, then, then what's the outcome? What's the result of this difference? So let's look at this. Curl of E is zero, which means uh, E dot DL is zero and then that gives you, uh, uh, allow you that uh, E field can be represented as a gradient of a scalar function. 
right? We talked about this many times. So that electric scalar potential can be written. And that makes the electro electrostatic problem way easier, right? Instead of dealing with E field with three components, we can deal with V, which has one component, convenient. And then we know that in an electrostatics, uh, Laplace equation can be written, right? Laplace equation is true or a Poisson's equation, right? So Laplacian of V is equal to rho divided by epsilon naught. And then when we solve this Laplace equation for point charge, line charge, surface charge, and volume charge, we can get like a four pi epsilon naught uh, 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 Q divided by R, four pi epsilon naught, you know, this and that and that, right? We've done this. And then if you go to the magnetostatics, uh, we cannot do the same thing because again, curl of B is non-zero. Curl of B is mu zero J, right? So that there's nothing like, uh, we cannot define a magnetic scalar potential as we do for the electric scalar potential, right? Instead, as we learned in our mathematics course, uh, we can define uh, B field as a curl of some, some vector potential. And as I said, this is not too much useful because Anyway, both of these are kind of three dimensional thing. So it's not too useful, right? But anyway, uh, we can do this. And in general, uh, uh, it, you know, in general, like a, a given vector field can be written as a, uh, like this, a divergent uh, uh, curl of a vector, vector field plus divergence, a gradient of a scalar field. So this is the general form. That is the Helmholtz theorem. And then uh, if this, this condition is satisfied, then we can erase this. And then if this condition is satisfied, we can erase that, okay? So that, but here's one, uh, one interesting thing you can do. There's a one interesting tweak. So now you write second equation. The, the Ampere's law, mu zero J is divergence, um, uh, uh, curl of B. And then B is again, curl of A, right? So curl of curl of A, curl of curl of, curl of A is this, okay? Which is a uh, minus Laplacian A plus gradient of divergence of A, okay? And then interesting thing is that uh, uh, you have a degree of freedom to freely choose uh, divergence of A. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what function you choose for divergence A, it wouldn't affect uh, the curl of A. So here again, what's important is the B field, right? And then, uh, as long as curl of A is the same value, you can do anything. And here, uh, this is the degree of freedom that we can choose. Like a, it doesn't matter what, what function you choose for uh, divergence of A, uh, curl of A is anyway the same. It's like this. So if you're not, if, if, you, if it's difficult for you, you can think of a V uh, electric potential. In electric potential, uh, you can always add some constant, right? If you add some constant, doesn't matter because if you take gradient, this constant anyway goes away and then you get the same E field, right? So uh, when you're defining V, there is a degree of freedom to choose constant. And, and because of that, we always set a reference point when we define V. And similar thing is happening here. It's not just simple as constant, but it's like a choosing uh, divergence of A, but no matter what function you choose for divergence of A, it wouldn't affect B field. So, so that's a degree of freedom. And then, uh, and then uh, 
in for uh, for magnetostatic problem, it's better to choose divergence of A is zero. This is called Coulomb gauge. And there's uh, more uh, choices of gauges, like a, a Lorentz gauge and, and other gauges. Uh, and, 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 and other gauges makes problems easy to solve in, in each cases. But in this case, Coulomb gauge is easiest. So if you take the Coulomb gauge, you make this term go away. Then what happens is that mu zero j is negative diverge, uh, negative Laplacian of A. And if you compare the equation form, they are the same, right? So Laplacian of potential is source. And here also Laplacian of potential is source. The only difference is that this one is scalar, but that one is vector. But anyway, if you look at the uh, full form, at each com for each uh, component, mu zero jx is negative Laplacian of ax, and then and then y and z. So it's just a three uh, set of three equations. Uh, which have the same form of this. So because they have the same mathematical form, the solution is same, okay? So we know that for a line charge, this is your solution, V. And then for surface charge, volume charge, this is the solution, we know this. So without even solving this problem, you know that uh, A can be written like this. Right, same same as this. This is basically exactly same, exactly same, exactly same. The only difference is that this J, K, L are just uh, vectors, but there's no curl or, or anything like that involved. It's basically the same, same equation, right? So uh, now, uh, and that's the beauty of choosing the Coulomb gauge. Because we chose Coulomb gauge, this simplification is possible, okay? And now uh, uh, what we can do is we can uh, re-derive re -derive, um, what is it? The, the um, Biot-Savart's law from this uh, vector potential. So let's, stay, let's take this and then take curve of this. So we can take, uh, we have a vector potential we obtained from uh, Maxwell's equations and then take curl of it to get B field, okay? And now uh, you, it's again important to make a distinction between source position and the position of interest. And here also DL integration also runs for the source position. Right, and then uh, curl is for the position of interest. So if you take the curl of it, uh, even though it looks a little complicated like this, you realize that this operator has nothing to do with this because this is prime coordinate. It's just the independent, right? So this one is zero because uh, uh, the, this uh, differential operator only acts on unprimed un coordinate. So this one is zero. And then you have only one uh, differentiation here. And then the result of the, this differentiation is this. I don't want to uh, prove it. You can prove it by yourself. And then uh, it reduces to this form, what we know as uh, Bio Savart's law, right? So if I uh, going back, what we've done was we began with two basic equations: curl of b. I mean, divergence of b is zero. Curl of b is mu zero j. So these are two uh, 
governing equation for the uh, uh, magnetostatics. And then by taking the Coulomb gauge, uh, we can write uh, A as a, uh, a simple form like this. And how do we know this? Because uh, this, uh, the J and A also satisfy Laplace equation, just like in electrostatics. We can take mathematical solutions we got from the electrostatics. So we can just borrow this and then we know A should look like this. And then by taking the curl of it, we go back to uh, Biot-Savart's law, right? So, um, yeah, so this is it. And then uh, finally, uh, we, can, we can talk a little bit more about uh, magnetic dipoles, like we, we talked about uh, electric dipoles. So uh, what we are gonna do now is we first, how can I? Yeah, so first we think about a current carrying loop. Like let's say we have a small current carrying loop. Okay, so loop, so current is flowing like this. And then uh, let's say we want to know what's the B field very, very far from the loop. So that R in this case, uh, is much, much larger than R prime, okay? And this is, let's say this is origin. And then uh, one over R minus R prime can be expanded like this. This is what we, what we did actually uh, in uh, electrostatics, right? We, 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 uh, when we did electrostatics and, and we talked about uh, elect electric dipole, we made this approximation too. Right, just you can remember. And then we can put this uh, one over, the, the approximation of one over R uh, to replace, uh, to rewrite uh, the vector potential, right? So if you rewrite the vector potential using this, uh, you, have, you have this form, okay? So the first, first one is this, the first term is this, the second term is going here. And then first term, you can easily check that is, this is just a, a closed loop integral of the L prime. So you're basically uh, integrating uh, uh, the L prime so that, and then, and then once you finish the closed loop, you're, you're at the same position so that this is always zero. Okay, because this is vector sum. So if you take a vector sum, it's, it, it goes to always zero at the same position, right? And then the second term uh, is non-zero. So you ended up having only the second term, right? So this is your uh, vector potential. If you have a closed loop and we, and, and also you want to know the B field far from the closed loop, okay? And, and from here, uh, you can apply Stokes theorem and uh, you know that the A, uh, the vector potential of a dipole can be written in, uh, in this form, like in this form, okay? So what this is, is that uh, mu zero, four pi r squared, and then m cross a r, and a r is the, the vec, uh, distance, uh, the direction vector, and then m is magnetic dipole moment, which is defined as i s, okay? So i is the current, s is the area of the, of the surface, and of course s is a vector, so uh, it, uh, it has a direction uh, to that normal to the surface. Okay, so if you define magnetic dipole in this way, then uh, magnetic uh, vector potential for the magnetic moment 
is mu zero m cross a r four pi r squared. So if you compare this with a previous like electric potential, electric dipole, electric dipole, dipole moment was defined by what? Like Q D and D was a vector, right? Q, so it's like a minus Q here, plus Q here, separation is D. And then from minus to plus, uh, the direction D vector is defined. And this is how you define uh, uh, electric dipole moment. Magnetic dipole moment instead uh, is defined like uh, current multiplied by area, and then direction is um, uh, normal to the surface. And how? And then some some of you may question like, okay, then let's say this is your uh, surface. Then there are two normal direction. One is up, the other is down. Then how can we choose? Well, uh, this is uh, this can be choosed uh, depending on the direction of current. So always we always follow right hand rule. So if the current is flowing this way, then by the right hand rule, like uh, you can just uh, align your four fingers uh, like along the current, then the direction of thumb becomes your direction of surface. So this is the correct choice. The upper, upper direction is the correct choice in this case. And then if your current was uh, flowing in opposite direction, then again, by the right hand rule, uh, you know, the downward is the, the correct direction. So this is how you define uh, the vector potential. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, dipole moment. Okay, so um, this is all I want to say today. And then uh, from next time, I'm gonna uh, redo this uh, dipole part and then talk a little bit more about dipoles, magnetic dipoles, and also talk about, uh, compare the electric dipole and magnetic dipole. and 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 that would be it for this lecture note. So uh, is there any question? Park Seon asks from the middle equation, is the part which is written in dot, dot, dot is negligible uh, compared to a dipole or can we eliminate dot, dot, dot part using another? Oh, 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 uh, yes, uh, we can, we can, oh, yeah, we can always ignore uh, this dot, dot, dot part. So uh, it's just, um, this is a good question, by the way. Uh, here, these things uh, is about the higher order terms. So when you expand a uh, function as a um, uh, series, uh, like a, a, as a, a Taylor series, uh, if you, if, if R is much, much larger than R prime, so that if we can do, uh, sorry, R prime R much, much smaller than one, then we can always ignore higher order terms, right? So, so what's included in dot, dot, dot is just higher order terms. And that's why we ignore it. And then uh, the reason we can ignore it is because uh, R is much, much larger than R prime. And of course, when R becomes closer and then uh, R becomes comparable with R prime, we cannot do, we cannot ignore it. And then uh, Kim Giwan asks, uh, like uh, following uh, up uh, the Fakris question, if we want to know about B rho and B C, do we take uh, Ampere's loop in a different manner? Yes, So, but that's difficult. So let's say, uh, for instance, here in this problem again, but this is really good question though. Uh, if we have a Ampere, uh, the line current, and then uh, what we said, what I said is that if we take Ampere's loop as a, um, as a circle, the only information about uh, B field is B phi, right? Because the Ampere's loop forces to extract the information about only the B phi. So in order to know B Z or B rho, Ampere's loop has to be some different shape so that it has some component aligned with B Z or B rho, right? 
And in that case, um, Ampere's law is always right. So you should always get the right answer, but like it's difficult to evaluate the integration because in that case, then now we need to think about the coordinate de dependence. The reason we chose circle is because we know by symmetry again, B is only dependent on rho. So if you take circle, we don't need to worry about the dependence along phi. Right, that's the region we chose a circle. And then if we take arbitrary, arbitrary uh, shape, uh, Ampere's loop, then we cannot ignore the possibility of having like B field having different um, uh, dependence on the coordinate variables. So it it ended up become difficult to evaluate the integration. So that's the case, right? But in, pre, in, in principle, yes, if you, if you have a different uh, Ampere's loop and then you can know all the uh, result uh, from the Ampere's uh, calculation, then yes, you can, you can uh, get the solution. Okay, so I guess, okay, Song Min Chan asks, can you explain about why divergence of A can be zero again, please? Uh, I think I can explain this later uh, next week, but if I uh, become brief, uh, divergence of A, choice of divergence A of A wouldn't affect B field. So no matter what value you choose for divergence of A, if you take curl of A, B field is the same, okay? So that's why we can choose whatever value for divergence of A, and that's gauge freedom. And then uh, we chose zero because it's mathematically more convenient because you then this equation reduces to Laplace equation, okay? So why we can do this? Uh, because choice of divergence of A is not important. It wouldn't affect, it's, it's important, but it wouldn't affect the resulting B field. That's the reason. Okay, so uh, if there is no other question, uh, I'd like to stop.